We've been talking a lot about choices these past few weeks, and we've got a few more weeks to go, or a couple more weeks to go, but uh, there's no question in my mind that the choice we're going to speak about this morning is going to be near and dear to all of our hearts. We're going to talk about the choice that we make of what to do with our money. The choice of what to do with our money. Now, nobody can get up and go to the restroom or get water, okay? <laughs> Stay right there. <laughs> There's probably no more divisive subject in the church than money. Uh, people's money and the church's money, for that matter. Probably the second most is, is no doubt in these days is music. What kind of music you're going to do and that kind of thing that can become very divisive. But I think that as it is with music, if we'll take a biblical approach toward it, we'll look at it through the eyes and the vision of the Holy Scriptures, that, that there's no doubt, and you just did that just right, didn't you? <laughs> that there is no doubt that we can come to a place where we can rest. I've told you all before, I grew up in a, what, a, a traditional church that would scare some of you all to death. There's not a, there is not a doubt in my mind that uh, we would be, I would be thrown out of the church, the denomination, for doing some of the music that we do. But I had to come to a place in my life where I have to understand it's not about me and what I like, it's about the Holy Spirit. It's about God and, and how He relates to people. He said, why are you talking about music? Because I want you to get that in your head. He said, why? Because it's the same thing about money. You know, money's not about you and me and, and, and you know, what we think and what we want to do. It's about what the Word of God says. Now, we're a Bible-believing church here. We're going to believe what the Scripture says. If the Scripture said that we were never supposed to give and that God would just uh, bring a Brinks truck, a Brinks truck up here every Monday morning and drop off all the money we needed, then that's what we would do. But I've looked and looked, and it's just not there. If the Scripture said what you're supposed to do is take your money and put it all in the lottery, and when you win, then you give some money to the church when you win, well, that's what we would do. But that's not what the Scripture says. Let me give you a little background uh, if, you, if you have your Bible and you want to go to the book of Haggai, some of you probably don't even know that's in the Bible, but it really is. And if you go to the last book in the Old Testament and go back three books, you'll get right there to the book of Haggai. Haggai was not a prophet. He was a, we don't think he was a prophet, but he lived at the time of Nehemiah. And if you're familiar with the story of Nehemiah, so many preachers have preached it, Nehemiah was given permission to go back to Jerusalem and build the walls up and later build the temple up. But what a lot of us don't know is what, what had happened there. And I'm going to give you a little historical background and then I'm going to uh, dive into the scriptures this morning. During, uh, uh, during um, Haggai's time, during the time of Nehemiah, not only had the church walls fallen down, the temple had gotten into ruins, but there were heathen people that were living in the temple, were renting rooms out in the temple. And that's how they made money. They took in, and to make that, uh, bring that to home, that would be like us not being able to pay the church bills around here. And so we decided to open a boarding house so that we could pay the church bills. What a shame. Not only that, the Levitical priesthood, the, the, the Levitical priests that were, were called by God to take care of the temple they were, and, and the grounds, they were the ones that were, you know, they did all the maintenance. They did everything. They, they did it all. They had left the temple because the people had quit giving, and because they had quit giving, these guys had to go find jobs. Now, God never called them to go get a job. He called them to take care of the temple. But they couldn't feed their families, so they were out harvesting and working in the fields. And, and it, was, 
you know, nothing necessarily wrong with that, except that the house of God had completely become in ruins. The walls had completely crumbled down. And then we get to Haggai, the first chapter, and verse 2. This is what the Lord of Heaven's army says. The people are saying the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Let's paraphrase that. The people were saying, what, why worry about the house of God? Why worry about the, the, the fence and, the, and, the, and the, the, the big wall that went around it? It's not time to do that. There are more important things to do. And then the Lord sent a message through Haggai, the prophet. Why are you living in luxurious houses when my house lies in ruins? Let that sink in for a minute. That's pretty heavy duty stuff, ain't it? Look at what has happened to you in verse 5. You have planted much, but you harvest little. You eat and you're not satisfied. You drink and you're still thirsty. Look at this. You put on clothes, but you cannot keep warm. And you put your wages, they disappear as though you were putting them in pockets full of holes. Let's paraphrase that into more modern terms. Why are you so concerned about your stuff? when the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ is suffering? Why are you so concerned about how you dress and what you look like when there are people out there who can't find a decent meal? You just keep on doing that. And you keep putting your money in your pockets and you keep saying, I don't have any money. And you don't realize you have holes in your pockets. We probably could stop right here and just let all this sink in. And it would be, for some of us, would be pretty devastating. Budgeting, borrowing, debt, saving, and financial topics are very important, but nothing is more important than probably our attitude about money. You say, what? Next slide there, I think. For where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. Let me just put that backwards. Where your heart is, that's where your treasure is going. I don't have this and I don't have that. I got to tell you, Jesus was pretty smart. I'm not up here to embarrass anybody. Now just let me go ahead and share a short bit of my testimony. I struggled. We struggled as a family with giving for years. We had the same arguments you have. We don't have it, can't afford it. I don't know what we're going to do if we do this. I, I, we've been through that. And, I, and my wife will tell you our pockets were full of holes. Seemed like we never could get ahead. The more of God's money we kept, the bigger the holes got. You see, the choice to close up the hole in our pocket begins with a change in our attitude regarding our money. I want you to listen to what I said. The choice to close those holes up. Now, what holes are they? Now, I'm going to be frank and honest with you. They're the holes that say, I can't give because we can't pay our bills. What, we got to buy shoes. We got to do this. We got to do I've been down that road. I'm telling you, those are holes in your pocket. That hole, that hole that says, when I win the lottery, I'll give 10%. You liar, you won't give 10% of $10. What makes you think you're going to give 10% of $50 million? 
What did Jesus say? I can't trust you with a little. How will I ever trust you with a lot? I paraphrase that. I, I've, I've had people tell me that. Oh, pastor, you know when I fill in the blank, inherit my money or, you know, win the lottery or whatever, I'm going to give, I'll, I may give more than 10% to the church. And I'm thinking, did you get paid this week? <laughs> Where's that? <laughs> Let's talk about our attitude. I'm not here to make you feel guilty. I'm here to point out what the Word of God says. And let me say this about guilt. Some people say, oh, that preacher made us feel guilty. Well, let me just tell you what we say around here. Guilt is the taxi cab that you get in to drive to the cross. Guilt sometimes is that thing that brings you to the reality of what Jesus has got to say. So there's nothing wrong with being guilty. There's something wrong with staying guilty, okay? You go out and rob a bank. Don't go home and say, well, Jesus said I didn't have to be guilty. Yes, you do. Next slide. It's not about us. That's a first attitude thing. It's not about you. Quit it. God is the owner. Mine, mine, mine. Boy, that's a four-letter word that we hate our kids to grow up saying, ain't it? Don't you hate that? It's mine. Give it back. It's mine, mine, mine. And yet, as parents, when we get our paychecks or our bounty, it's the first thing we say, mine, mine. The most pervasive financial advice you ever get is the voice in your own head. <laughs> Ain't that true? The most persuasive financial advice that you ever get is a voice in your own head. You see, somewhere in our lives we learned a philosophy that develops and says that this is mine and this is private and, and, and I can do this, this, and this, and this, and that ain't anybody's business. And by the way, I've heard that. Ain't the church's business what I do with my money. No, it's not. But it sure is God's business. And let me tell you what, I'd rather have me after you than God. We have all been there. Our ideas of, bo of money boil down to one thing. Now I want you to listen to me. I know this is hard, okay? But this, the idea of, of the ch what we do with our money boils down to one thing. What is best for who? For me. For me. God's ownership is a foreign concept to most of us. We think about it as our money, our possessions. And yet the Bible makes it clear that God owns everything. Colossians 1, 6 says all things were created by Him. Deuteronomy 10, 14 says everything belongs to God, including the heavens and the earth. Psalms 50, verse 10 says every animal of the forest belongs to me. Talk, speaking of God. And, and verse uh, uh, chapter 50, verse 12, the world is mine and everything that is in it. And, and Haggai chapter 2, verse 8, the Bible says the silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares the Lord. Everything in the heavens and the earth is the Lord's, is a kingdom, and you are exalted and you're a head over everything. I think the next slide. No, we're, we're okay, right there. Back. No, right, that's right. The earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, they that dwell therein. Listen to that, guys. I know that what this sounds like. We're beating you up. No, we're not. I want you to understand the scriptures. The old preachers used to say the hills were God's, the cattle on the hills, and all the potatoes that were living in the hills, they all belonged to God. And what God said was, honor me, show me that you love me by giving. Next slide. No, my
It's all about tithing. All right. Let's clear up some stuff. We are instructed to give freely from what God has placed into our possession. And this begins with a tithe. And the word tithe means a, means a tenth. I'm going to tithe 3%. No, you're not. The word itself means 10%. You can't tithe. You can't 10% 3%. And you can't tithe 20%. You can double tithe, triple tithe, but the tithe is 10%. There's a notion in the, in the Christian church in America that tithing has somehow been a part of the law and that we don't have to obey the law anymore. It, it, tithing was under the law. Let's clear that up. Tithing was never under the law. As a matter of fact, in, in Genesis chapter 14, 18 through 20 is when we see the first tithe mentioned in the Scripture. And the law hadn't even been given yet. Abraham tithed before there was a law. What? I didn't know that. Yes. Tithing has never been a part of the law. It was always a, a part of the economy of God that men would give a 10% of their stuff back to God. The law? Matthew 23, 23. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites. Hypocrites, okay? You pay a, a tithe, a 10% of mint and anise and cumin, and, and you've neglected the way to your matters of law, justice, and mercy, and faith. Look at here. These you ought to have done. Stop. What? You should continue to tithe. Jesus didn't say, don't do this anymore. He said plainly that even the hypocrites, even the Pharisees, and even the scribes that were tithing, he says you should have done and should keep doing that. I find it amazing. Some people will say, well, it ain't God's because I earned it. <laughs> I'm the one that earned it. I mean, I don't work for God. God didn't come down and sign my paycheck. Now, you may not say it that way, but we, we feel that way sometimes, so I earn this. Well, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 17, are you listening to me? When you say in your heart, my power and my might of my hands have gained me this wealth, isn't that what we say? I earn this. You shall remember the Lord God. Why? For he it is who gives you power to get wealth. It is he that establishes the covenant that he swore to you uh, by your fathers as it is this day. What covenant? The covenant that God would empower people to earn and that they would make a covenant with them that they would return back to him 10%. That did not go anywhere when Jesus walked the face of the earth. Folks, we have got, the, this is wrong. This mentality that we've, we've adopted in America. Where does it come from? It comes from wealth. It comes from wealth. It's like the two guys sitting on the porch and two cowboys. And one said, well, Tom, you know, if you had 100 horses, I could have 50 of them, couldn't I? Why, you know you could, Zeb. I'd be glad to give you 50 horses if I had 100. Well, Tom, if you had 20, could I have 10 of those horses? Why, you know you could have 10 of them. Well, Tom, what if you had two horses? Could I have one? He said, that's not fair. You know I got two horses. <laughs> the more we have gained in America, the less we want to give back to God. People will, listen, I, this is a statistic, folks. The people who give the highest percentage of money back to God are the people who make the lowest amounts of money. That's the truth. The person who works two jobs, and uh, two part-time jobs, and, and struggles to make ends meet, that person will actually give more percentage of what they earn than a guy making $100,000 a year or $100,000 a month or millions of dollars. John Wesley said, Don't you know that God entrusted you with your money to feed hungry people? 
to clothe people, to help strangers and widows and fatherless. And he gave that money to you to spread it as far as would go, would go to relieve the wants of mankind. How can you and I, how dare we defraud the Lord by taking our money and using it for what we want? Let that sink in. Yeah, when it comes to comfort, when it comes to burying our loved ones, we want the preacher to teach and preach from the Psalms, from the Old Testament. We, we, we want wisdom, we go to Proverbs and, and we glean that wisdom. When we have stumbled, we, we'll trust the Old Testament's guidance. When, it's, when we're broken, we'll go to the Old Testament, look up the Psalms and, and maybe the book of Job and, and different things. We'll apply those to our lives. We are willing to believe in the characters of the, of the Old Testament. We're willing to take what they taught us and apply it to our lives. But when it comes to our money and giving in particular, we say, oh, the Old Testament, wow, that's outdated. Well, if it's so outdated, how come it is that you go to it all the time for comfort? Yes, when it comes to our money, we, we take this perceived silence, and it's not perceived in the New Testament, and we take control of our money because it is more comfortable to our flesh. Guys, I'm pulling figures out of the air. $500. A tithe of that is what? $50. Okay. You say, well, I, $50 is my tithe, but I'm not, I, I just, I'm not comfortable with that. I mean, I got to buy new tires, I got to do this, I got to do it. And I write me a check for $10. Now, you and I both know, you're going to write that check for $10, drop in the offer plate, and you're going to go home feeling good about yourself. Because you gave something. You gave what you, what you felt comfortable at. That, that's your flesh. <clears throat> That's your flesh that's it's, it's satisfied with less than what God wants. Tithing is not gone. Tithing is ignored. Tithing, the, the, I want you to understand and listen to what I'm saying because it's so important for you and for me, for all of us. Tithing went nowhere when Jesus resurrected. He didn't take tithing and throw it by the wayside. And he said, you know what, it's just for the people who really feel like they can't afford to give. He didn't do that. Do you know you go to other parts of the world, and my wife and I have had the pleasure of being in other parts of the world, and they have, I mean, they make like $10 a month. And you know they give like two bucks out of the ten bucks? They don't understand our concept at all. They don't make any sense to them. This is an American thing. What was a 1.5 billion was the last lottery? That that 1.5 billion. Wow. That was, what's a what's a tithe of that? 150 million dollars. I ain't yet read about the church that got theirs. <laughs> I know we didn't get it. I've been looking in the mailbox every day. Guys, our tithing is not about being comfortable. It's about doing the right thing. We should never as a church ever have to look at our church, and it's not that way, but our church being crumbled, people not being able to be taken care of, people that need things, we can't help them. We should never be able to do that when we've got adults that are working and, 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 and have things. and We should never, we should never, ever, ever have to become like the folks in Haggai's day. Nah, well, you know, it's all about me. Next, next slide. It's about being like God. See, it's not about you. It is about tithing, but it's about being like God. It's about being generous in our giving. God loved the world. And if we put a period there, that would be awesome. God loved the world. But how did he demonstrate his love? According to Romans, he gave his son. He gave you everything that you would ever need in life. He gave Jesus. 
Because that's what God does. He's a giver. God is a giver. In Acts chapter 20, verse 35, the Scripture says, In all things I have shown you by working hard, help the weak, remember the words of the Lord Jesus. Oh, that's so precious. What did Jesus say? Oh, He said it's more blessed to give than receive. Wow. It's about being like God. Not God. I didn't say you become God. It's about being like God. How do you do that? You give. <coughs> what kind of giving? You give in love. I think I have a slide. Yes. Amy Carmichael said you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. Don't you dare tell people, I love you, but you can't have nothing of mine. <laughs> we make a living by what we get. Listen to this. We make a life by what we give. I love this saying, what we spend, we lose. What we keep will be left for other people. <laughs> oh, but what we give away will be ours forever. Don't lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moths and thieves and folks come in and steal. Lay it up in heaven. Wouldn't it be great you get there and you're shaking hands and hugging and, and then one of the angels come up and say, Oh, brother, come here. i got to show you something. And you go up there and he opens up this big warehouse and there are all kinds of people sitting in there. All kinds of, just, just man, people's lives have been changing. What's this? This is what you sent ahead to heaven. Well, I don't even know that man. Yeah, but you boxed him up a box of food and sent it off to his family. I don't know that person. No, but you faithfully gave and tithed, and, and your pastor gave him $10 so he could buy gas out of the money that you donated. Look what you sent ahead. And you know what, what Paul said? These are our ornament. What you going to be, what kind of necklace are you going to have when you get to heaven? Some of us going to have one made out of bones. Some of us going to have one made out of people. You, gonna, you, gonna, you, you know when you get to heaven, you're going to meet people you ain't never met, and they're going to shake your hand, love you, give you a kiss on the cheek, and tell how much they love you. You're going, who are you? You don't know who I was? I was the next door neighbor to that family that you gave food to over at Oakley Elementary School. And they told me about you. And because they told me about you, I looked it up online and, and I gave my heart to Christ. Because you gave. I don't want to sound hard. I, I really, and that's not my intentions is to be some kind of a hard, fired, brimstone, mean, devil preacher, you know, that screams and hollers at people and spits at them. Now, I may spit at you, but it ain't because I don't like you. That's not my goal. My goal is not to embarrass anybody here. If you're leaving here embarrassed, you, you didn't get the message. The message is not you going home and being embarrassed. Let me be very clear about it. I, I hope this is the truth. I have never, ever personally approached any person on a personal level and said, hey, why don't you give? I will never do that. That's between you and him. But you can't be right with him if you don't know what he says about it. That's what this is about. Well, I'm glad you said that, but I just can't do it. That's your choice, not mine. Well, let me tell you this. To whom as much is given, much will be required. Some of you may not have even thought about tithing not being in the New Testament, and so you haven't been doing that. Well, now you know. What you going to do about it? Some of you have been taking God's money and doing stuff with it. I've done it in the past, and, and God knows my heart. I'm ashamed of it. I'm not telling you something that I'm some perfect dude that, you know, started tithing when I was nine years old, and I've never missed a week of tithing. Liar. Guys, I'm not telling you it's bad to take and, and do things for yourself. If you're hearing that, you're hearing the wrong thing. 
what I am saying is this. God established a way that the ministry and the church should be taken care of. And he never, ever said, nah, we're going to do it a different way. He never did. It's not about we can't pay the light bill. It's not about I don't have money for gas. And it's not about you guys as a church taking care of me. That, the church is doing great. It's about you and the blessing that God wants to give you. That's what it's about. I've talked too much. It's time to pray and close up. And I just hope you catch my heart. My heart is not one of meanness. Or, my heart is for you. My heart is for you. Father, thank you so very much for all you do for us. God, for those of us, and I include myself in that group that struggles sometimes with the choice of what we're going to do with our money. Oh, God, convict us. No, no, don't convict us by, by, how, by, by this mean, terrible God that's going to you know, do something terrible to us. That's not the kind of conviction. Just convict us by the Word and what the Word says we ought to be doing. And God, I pray, Father, for this group of people. I pray that those that have kind of been on the fence or on the borderline about what to do as far as giving is concerned, I pray that you'll speak to their heart. I pray that, God, those of us that have been giving, that, God, you would continue to speak to our hearts about giving what you want us to give, you know, above our tithes. God, how we love you. Thank you, Lord, for all you do for us. Be lifted up. In Jesus' name, amen.